So uh, let's just go right into it. I, you know, the, our next segment here is um, uh, navigating Asia Pacific by the record labels. Uh, you know, obviously here on stage we have a, a very good cross section of labels. Uh, these are voices from different parts of the label world uh, that have an impact here on this region. And I think through their stories, we can really begin to learn more about the Asian uh, landscape as it pertains to, to record labels and the dance music space. Um, so let's just get into uh, some questions um, and uh, get the conversation going. Um, first question is a very simple one. What is a record label today? Jody, what do you think? How would you define it? Well, um, I don't, I'm the only one that's not from a label, um, but um, it, it varies and it's, it's ever changing now in the landscape, I feel. Um, right Rhythm works with uh, more than 400 electronic music labels um, across 80 subgenres of electronic music and um, a lot of the small to medium sized labels, um, they don't really do that much in comparison to these guys, especially the majors that do a fantastic job in um, developing their, their artists. Um, right now, the small to medium sized labels, they, they're just they, the stepping ground for um, electronic music artists to, to up their career at the, at the early stage, I feel. So, I mean, they used to have, you know, when we talked about physical media, a label uh, would produce vinyl records or CDs and ship and market and distribute. That definition has changed so much. I mean, is, is a label just uh, a brand that is essentially a marketing company for music now? Or like, uh, what, do you, what do you think, Ryan? Like, what is the role? What is the definition? What do they do? Really? Um, yeah, it depends. Uh, to Joe's point, you're talking about independents or majors, certainly from a major side. At the heart of it, it's about recorded music, but it does um, so much more these days. Yeah, obviously the physical markets declined in predominantly most markets, excluding Japan, say Germany. But the, um, you have marketing a major capacity. You've got third uh, party rights now. You've got uh, a whole host of brand deals, etc., that come into the play, I think. So it definitely changed from what it was from a major sense, but at the heart, still recorded music is, is the basis of what we're doing, which is a marketing tool for a lot of these artists, you know, to then go off and do live shows, etc., which you're seeing much more money in, you know, for the artists, I guess, these days. Okay. And, and Nabi, for, for Mavex, I mean, what do you think? Do labels uh, matter anymore? Are they still relevant? Are they still a relevant piece of this value chain um, to the consumers, to the artists? Like, do people care about a label anymore? Um. Um, basically, uh, our company is uh, um, 30 years ago, and it's just a small dance label. And however, now a uh, general entertainment company. And uh, Let's maybe hold a little closer. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, then um, now um, our company um, uh, reconstructed, and then um, label and live concert company in the uh, joined a uh, combined one uh, sorry one company so um, uh, label um, is not, not center at the moment however still um, center of the heart um, um, so um, I, th um, I think uh, label uh, people need the label however label has to uh, has to uh, change the role um, for more uh, close to the uh, customer, close to the artist, close to the, um, uh, yeah, uh, along the other um, business partners. So um, I believe that the label is uh, still alive, and however, it has to change the roles. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the perception of a label has changed a lot. I mean, you know, I'm a, a house music DJ myself, and labels used to be important. It's like when you're flipping through your crate, picking that next track, it's like you're looking, you know, for the label, the yellow cover with the purple logo. I mean, it's like that meant something, but now it's, like, it's just digital. I mean, if I'm buying tracks on Beatport, you know, I don't even really pay attention to the label anymore. So I wonder the relevance to, to a consumer, George. I mean, what's, what's your opinion in terms of mind share with, with, with a music consumer, of like the, the relevance of a brand behind it? Well, I think the most important thing that in the end, people want to be part of a community. 
uh, be part of a movement, I guess. And I think a label can be part of that, to be honest. If you look at Barong family, for example, but also we at Mixmash, uh, it's all about being a family and uh, be part of a movement, I guess. Okay. And on labels, I mean, how does a label in, in Asia make their releases rise above the clutter? Because there's so many releases every day in this genre, uh, it's very easy to get lost in, in, on, on the shelves of retail, right? So I would be interested to hear uh, both from the, from the indie side and from the big label side on, you know, what's one or two strategies or tactics uh, that you can just sort of get noticed in that avalanche of releases um, um, every day, every week. Uh, Tan, I mean, what do you do uh, with Hummingbird? How do you get a release to rise above the rest uh, in retail? Um, it's very different almost year to year these days, what, how, how you promote music. Uh, recently, these last two years, we realized playlist is a big, big way to put, put your music out. It used to be like the top 10 list of the popular chart of the music platform. But now, even that, is not as significant as, as like, is your music uh, featured enough in different playlists? Because every time, whether you go on Apple Music or Spotify or different things, first thing you see that pops up is oh, the, the workout playlist or all kind of different genre music playlists. And is your music featured in enough of those playlists for us is how we uh, promote music. Uh, when, when everyone starts starting to stream music these days instead of downloading it from iTunes versus like five years ago. Okay, playlists, huge tool. Uh, Bart, uh, from, from the major perspective, I mean, if you look at it, the Asian market, what are some things you've seen work and not work to, to rise above the clutter? Well, I mean, not just for the Asian market. I think, I mean, there's a saying, it's not from me, but like uh, I, I, I wholeheartedly support it. It's like the, the best marketing and promo for a track or for an artist is, is good a and R. I I mean, if you, if you release good stuff, it just, it just usually tends to sort of pop up anyway. And then apart from, from, from making sure you're working on the right things or the right, the right songs, the right artists, is, it still takes, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that nowadays you can do centrally, if you like. If you go to global editors on Spotify and Apple Music, you can, you can, you can talk to those people. But I think the, 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 the mistake that uh, a lot of people still make is that it, it, it really still takes a village of people to, 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 make, to, to make a career, to actually sort of work. Uh, you know, there's so much more to do. There's like, we still work radio, we still work press, PR, blogs, everything. So it, it takes huge teams to actually make something go globally at the same time, coordinate it. Um, and that is obviously what, what, what in particularly major labels add to the mix. And okay, so that, that's kind of, that, that sort of raises another question itself. I mean, it takes a village of people, a small army, to, to push an artist and to work a release territory by territory, channel by channel. Um, from a small label perspective, George, or indie label perspective, let's say, um, how many of those functions should be uh, should be insourced inside the company, and how many of those things can you farm out on uh, vendor contracts and outsourcing agreements? For example, do you need to have a full-time graphics person on your staff, or is that something that you're comfortable farming out? Do you need like what what parts are within your four walls, and what uh, what, uh, what aren't? Well, we prefer to have everything in house, um, basically, so we can move quickly. Um, and we basically have everything uh, covered from socials to marketing, graphic design, PR, uh, streaming, like all the assets within the label are covered in-house. And I think that's, yeah, like I said, I prefer to have everything in-house just to, yeah. Yeah. Is there a tipping point for that decision? I mean, is it a certain amount of releases or scale or uh, distribution girth? Or like, where, at what point do you say, we're going to hire 10 people to make an office? Is it, what's, the, what's that shift? Uh, well, that's a good question, actually. Um, well, it totally depends on the financial situation, I guess. <laughs> um, and the more artists we are... need lots of money. Say what? Needs a lot of money for that. Yeah, and you have to find the right ten people. And that also and, takes and time. Yeah, yeah, that's hard to do as well. Yeah, definitely agree. Yeah, I think that's the 
the hardest part to find the right people to. Yeah. 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 I mean, Tan, you, you, you come from a similar, I would ask you the same question, because your, your, your company is more than just a label. Um, you are a concert promoter and producer. You are the marketing company. You are the artist manager. That whole ecosystem is focused around really one artist, right? Yeah. Which is Jem. Uh, Jem is, has been called the, the Adele of, of China, right? Massive superstar. And her village of people is exactly Tan's company. This is what they do all day, every day, right? Yeah. So what are some of those functions that you do keep within the team? What, where do you trust outside parties to deliver uh, in that machine, in that, in that uh, process? We have always tried to uh, do just the essential part that we have to do on our own because at the end of the day, like, it's still managed under the same umbrella, so we didn't want to branch out too much. But because this market is such a new region, it's really hard to outsource a lot of the things that you, you would expect you would find professional company to do. And at, at the end of the day, we, we ended up being all the things that you were mentioning er, earlier. We end up being our own uh, production company, our own music production. The music production was mainly the thing we wanted to do at the beginning. But from there on, we didn't find enough partners to promote it the way we want or to put it out the way we want, to market it the way we want. And then step by step, in the last 14 years, we became this 360 record company that we are today, uh, that, that's managing an artist that, that's doing really well in China. And it's always an experiment for us. But the first thing we try to do is always to find the right person to do it with us first. Instead of doing it for us, I said doing it with us. Because if someone is doing it for you, it's only, it's always going to end. But these days, promotion is 360, uh, like 300, uh, 24, 24 seven, basically. Like, like you don't stop promoting. You don't have like, oh, I have the album promotion period of three months, and then afterwards the, the artist goes, goes to do their own thing. No, it doesn't exist. Instagram is there every single day. You know, like every day someone needs to help the artist think about what to propose, uh, what she's wearing, you know, on the tour, are you writing? Are you p putting out l uh, little things that uh, is inspiring for your fans and all those stuff? This always needs to be things that's being designed and, 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 and in the background these days. So, so Tan, so you have your Hong Kong team uh, that is this sort of new school version of a label, right? You're the music publisher, you're the manager, you're actually the producer of shows almost every weekend for Gem yourself, you're the PR, you're the design, you're, you're, you're the whole thing. Uh, that's an interesting model, I think, in itself. Um, and I've asked you this before, I'll, I'll ask you for the audience. I mean, your company is doing all of that basically for one artist, which is Jem. What happens if Jem leaves? Then we uh, all celebrate. <laughs> you know, we had a great time and uh, we all did something we enjoy for, for the period it lasts. But uh, uh, of course, we, we, we're looking into expanding the roster at the same time. But when you're handling so many things, it's, it's at the same time really hard. So almost to expand, we need to start another team of people. And to train up another manager or A&R person or something is as hard as finding a good artist at the end of the day. I, I, I'm sure we all agree uh, on, on the stage here. People who is working in the background is as hard to source that, that are talented as the artists themselves. And, uh, in, in China right now, that's not something that just because you have the will to do it or you have the resources to hire someone that, that you could easily stumble upon that. It's almost everything needs to be nurtured, everything needs to be developed, and uh, we're trying our best to develop the project we're developing right now. And hopefully we get to develop more and more things down the road. But there's still artist att attrition, right? Like, people, like do, you, do you hedge against that by claiming part of the artist's IP? Uh, we, we own all the master recording of the artists, yeah. Okay. And we co-write some of the songs with, with the artists, but mainly it's, it's all the artists' own writing. And we help to develop the writing into uh, something that, what the audience actually wants. And, and you've explained your own development of Gem as s sort of mirroring the, um, uh, the Western model of, of pop stars. Um, and how they tell their, they write their own songs and tell their own stories from their own pasts. Can you elaborate a little bit on that and, and how that came to be and how you apply that to, to your artist, to Jem? 
I myself is a musician, and, and me and my business partner, uh, he, he handles all the music productions. And we, we're both music lover and musician in heart. So we basically are trying to develop an artist into an artist that we want to see that's doing Chinese music. And in that process, very naturally, we, we model it behind many of our uh, idols and, and mus music heroes and stuff like that, who, who like you say, all do their own writing, put their life experience into their music, and it's really authentic. And that's what we have tr always tried to instill in our artists. And, and I feel like that's one of the main reasons why our artists has been successful as well in China, is when, when there's so many noise and, and distortions, right? The thing that really comes through at the end is authenticity and, 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 and emotions, the, the real emotions and not the fabricated design, the money pile up, your promotion and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, and you, you, made a, you made a point there that um, you and your team are, are musicians. So, Ryan, from the ma major perspective, uh, who do you think, who runs the Asian music industry? Is it music lovers? Is it business people and managers? Is it other interests? Like, who's really running the show out here from your viewpoint, uh, your perch as a, a major on, label? On dance music or the Let's Asian music? Because that's a big question. Dance music. <laughs> um, you look, dance music, I think, um, it's always back to the consumers. I think this scene is such a young scene, which is so exciting about it. It's in so many levels, not just the record labels, but yeah, other industries developing and emerging, and we're finding... You know, the, the local champions of press, media, you know, uh, all sorts of levels of support, as well as recorded industry and artists. So I think right now it's definitely the consumers. They're telling us, you know, they're finding out for themselves what they still like. It's in development stage, you know, of, uh, discovering new music, new sounds that are coming through. You know, like I think all of us probably here started uh, as a fan of dance music. I think that's one great thing about dance music. I know certainly uh, most people I've come in contact with and you find a way, you go, okay, how do I keep, continue to do this, work through this? And I think that's what's happening in the Asian market right now is people are just discovering this you know, thing, dance music, you know, how do I find out more about it? You know, there's EDM, there's underground, there's so many other sounds. Uh, to Ben's point yesterday, I think he's talking about, it's not just about being stars on stage, it's about having publicists, having good teams, having good art you know, designers, etc. that still have a contact with dance music. So it's definitely in the hands of the consumers, I think. There's definitely companies that are, you know, swimming around or aware of what's going on, but there's, I, I wouldn't say they're leading the charge at this stage. Okay. Nabi, what do you think? Who's, who's sort of behind the scenes in Asia, do you think? Is it musician-driven or business interests? Yes. Um, Japan um, is a very different from the Western um, countries. And, um, we are, uh, Japan is the second largest music market in the world. Uh, uh, second. However, um, it's a very isolating country uh, on the music side. Um, most 90% uh, of the music, whole music market in Japan uh, is J-pop and Japanese pop, including uh, K-pop, Korean pop. So um, international music uh, is a very limited market. Um, however, um, for example, um, one of the biggest in the Japanese um, boy group, uh, idol group, um, they're a huge success in Japan. Um, um, Afrojack and the produced for them, and then and the, that uh, uh, song was huge successful in Japan. Uh, and um, we still have a physical market, and that uh, physical is at eighty percent of our mo music market is, at, uh, and twenty percent is uh, digital. So um, uh, that thing uh, sold out. At uh, half million on um, physical sales. So it um, means that uh, in Japan, and we have um, our, uh, our own market. So um, it's totally different from the Europe. And, and also on the music subscription service and uh, uh, now growing up. And however, uh, Spotify in Japan, uh, it's at five position not the um, biggest in the music subscription service. So um, it's a totally different 
However, um, we uh, Japanese people uh, love the music, and the people pay to the um, pay uh, for the music. So an um, artist um, eventually uh, connected to the artist, and so on. Um, um, yeah, I think um, Asian market like in uh, Japan. Um, uh, like that, so um, I think, um, yeah, in the future, um, that kind of um, Asian market uh, will grow in. However, in a totally different way from the Western side. So, um, um, international music have to be uh, localized for uh, especially uh, Asian market. I should say also, to my point before, Korea is also to that point of K-pop. That's definitely run by media companies and you know, sort of from that top-down model where we're talking about dance music, I think, yeah, and ter every territory is slightly different as well, but uh, China as a whole, I think it's still in the consumers, but yeah, Korea, Japan, you've got that control media thing coming up from the top. What do you think, Bart? I think that the, one of the, the sort of uh, recurring statements, if you like, on, on the stage here in the last two days is that, you know, you can't, you know, it's like Asia is not, it's not one thing. It's like there is so many, there's so, those markets are so different and the situation in each market is so different. Um, and I think the only, the only thing that, that, that is sort of common is basically, yes, uh, consumers decide what they like usually on their own without being able to influence them too much and 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 the the main thing for me still is it's like it starts with the artist and the music and it's like do you you know get do you get the music to a, to the right level as to sort of can you actually work with it can you export it and i think um i think that will all come together in in uh, the, the the more streaming gets sort of uh, gets to go in this region, I think it'll become a little bit more unified, if you like, and you'll see a, a, a more pan-Asian hits, if you like, that sort of, that, that cross borders, regardless of how diff different the markets are, and that, that's when it gets really interesting. To, to answer your question, I, I think in China, the, the most dominant player who decide what music is popular or not is actually the audience, and then, the next player is actually the technology company like QQ Music, uh, NetEase, and, and Xiaomi and, and all the other music streaming platform where people stream music for free these days and, and whatever music they feature is always going to be the f first song that they, they, they listen to uh, on that day. And the biggest promotion uh, platform for, for music actually is still TV in China. And it's, it's not radio, it's, it's TV. Like recently, the biggest type of music genre to get, that got a big bum and big boost in China is hip hop, because they got a reality TV competition called like China's Got Hip Hop. And suddenly all, all the kids are discovering hip hop and discovering that, you know, actually there are rappers in, in China from all kinds of different uh, cities and stuff. And, and that's also how our artists got famous, is, is through a singing competition show in China. And ch TV definitely is the biggest driving uh, promotion force. So I'm very curious to find out, like in different countries and like Japan and different places, what what order would you put the the main driver behind the music scene as well? Nabi, what would you what would you say in Japan? What is that order? Um, yeah, as I told you, um, um yeah, Japan is the Japan and so on. Um, uh, it's a totally different and, uh, with the, the other Asian country. So, um, um, however, um, I think you know, we will connect to the, the other Asian country as well. And, um, like an, um, one of the um, biggest uh, uh, social media platform called Line, L-I-N-E. Line is the biggest in, uh, in Japan. Um, however, Line is also biggest, uh, big in uh, Taiwan and in Indonesia and... Um, for people who don't know Line, it's Thailand basically that, WeChat yeah. for, for Japan, yes. Korea, and, and like, like it's a message uh, app like WhatsApp or WeChat. Yes, so on the Line has a uh, music 
subscription service called Line Music. And Line Music is the second um, biggest in Japan at the moment. And uh, first uh, is uh, Apple Music. So on an Apple and on Line Music has 60% uh, of a whole music um, subscription service and share. So on Line is a leader uh, for the, uh, uh, basically a Line Music uh, is a joint venture com company with a Line, us, and a Sony. So um, uh, we uh, proceed to the, um, yeah, uh, entertain and, um, to the, in Japan and, and Asia as well. So um, I think this kind of a, um, social media platform, um, local platform, um, should be a, a, a proceed the um, next music market in Japan and Asia as well. Okay. Um, George, question for you. I mean, we talked about, uh, you know, Tan mentioned um, be, being featured on QQ, right? What a big driver that is. Whether it's QQ music, whether it's Spotify, whatever music service it is, being featured is a huge deal. That's like being, you know, uh, at the store on the shelf at eye level, like that's you're going to sell more units when you're featured. Uh, so George, whether it's QQ or Asia, whether it's Spotify, rest of the world, regardless of the territory, uh, I'm curious. I mean, how do you get a track to be featured on one of these platforms? It means so much, but you you can't tell Spotify I want my track featured. I mean, how how does the process work? Make Is it hit. influence? Is it relationships? Like, well, well, we actually try to tell them that, but <laughs> they need to listen in the end. Um, but that's uh, the main reason why we have hired someone dedicated to streaming, just to make those connections, build a network, uh, find the right people at Spotify, but also at Deezer to make sure we get featured in, in the right playlists. Uh, yeah. But, but what does that mean? So that's like making a request, it's calling in a favor. What are the mechanics of that placement uh, you know, to, that, that is so important to, towards sales and popularity? Sorry. Can you say that again? Like, what are the mechanics of that? So, is it like I pick up the phone and call my, my account rep, or like I'm just like, how do we, you know, how do you get that positioning? Oh, it totally depends, but it actually, there are, well, we took someone for dinner last week. <laughs> we tried. I, still, I, mean, I still think that the, most of the streaming services are figuring out themselves still how yeah. they want to be approached uh, by by the industry. Um, I mean, it's comparable to what radio plugging is mm -hmm. uh, to a degree. It's like you go and try and convince people from like that, that your artist, your track is, is worth supporting because you've got massive appeal or reactions or people, people already, you know, radio is going to play it or is doing massive gigs or, or, or whatever. It's like you, you try and find reasons for, for them to to agree with you. Ultimately, it comes back to what you said before, but, um, George, um, sorry, uh, but it's um, about having a hit, you know, if it's a good song, you can convince these people as much as you want to play a song, but if it's a good song, they'll put it in there on their own accord, like it's, and I'm all for, we get in there and work as hard as we can, but if a song's great, it'll stand out, that's, you're going to get that success put into a playlist and get that through. Well, maybe for you major guys, that's the case, yes. But for, for us as an independent, it's quite difficult actually to get featured and, and in the right playlist. So we have to invest a lot of time and effort to, to, to make those connections. Because you don't have the volume that, that the major guys do. You don't have that, that, that clout, right? So it's, it's more difficult to have the voice with these, with these platforms. Or no? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's still we we. I mean, we don't get everything on that we want to either. It's like the thing is, what you what you have is like uh, compared again to 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 radio promo, if you like. It's like there's data that you can use to support and sort of uh, and obviously streaming services have the same or and better data. I mean, if you if you tell them a bullshit story, they will know. So uh, totally, you know. Absolutely. And to it that point, I mean... It doesn't, doesn't stop us trying. I was like, well, I, I have to, you know, I've got uh, Ministry of Sound, Ultra Records, Black Butter, you know, uh, Martin Garrix, you know, Cargo Records, all competing. Like, it's not like I've just got one record and walk in. They all want to be equally treated and get their record at the top. So we have the same issues of how do we get those records featured and all those, and it's, I think it's a universal thing. And there's thousands of records coming out, you know, daily that all, everyone wants that new, you know, Music Friday playlisting spot. And... Ultimately, I think these uh, curators, it's 
we can say as, as much as we want, but if there isn't a story, there isn't a reaction, or if there isn't a good song, they're going to just make their own decision. Yes, you need to have those relationships. Yes, you need to have that going to end. Yes, you need to invest that time 100%. I totally agree with that. Based on my experience, actually, with all dealing with the streaming platform that are technology company based, they're really looking at figures at the end of the day. So they will feature you if you have the demand, if you have previous record of uh, things that you can show that you, you, you're being wanted and list played a lot. And if you're not famous, it's very hard to get that, right? But that's why all artists or DJ and stuff, they need to find their own way to promote their own things before it gets featured. And YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, all this stuff, uh, SoundCloud, anything that you can do. It, find the right collaboration that nobody discovered yet, you know. A cover a song that, that is a hit in somewhere else that, that the people in locally haven't heard of it yet. Find whatever ways, you know, get naked on your YouTube video, whatever you want to do, but whatever you can get attention, that will help you the next step to actually be featured on, on a different platform. It's just about getting signed as well, I guess. It's about how do you differentiate yourself you know, from all the people producing records. It's, yeah, have, have a story. I think you're gonna make more attention. You've got a community, you've got a following, or you're, you've got a bunch of, you know, you've created a, your own club night, etc., and you've risen to the top, and you've got a community around you, you've got a voice, then people will take notice, and I think that goes to streaming to being signed as well. And get live, live show is another great, great platform. And write a good demo submission, that's how you get signed. Yeah, because uh, I mean, it's funny, like, I, I, I mean, I've had small um, dance music labels of my own that I've started, and I remember, like, to get featured on Beatport, we're talking like eight years ago, um, it was collecting feedback from DJs. So you would send out promos first before it ever hit Beatport to, to a database of big DJs around the world, and then you would get their quotes, like their support. Like, this track is supported by John Digweed or by, you know, Hardwell or whoever, and I would literally send in a sheet of bullets of the comments that DJs had made on the release I was trying to push, send it to my Beatport rep and say, see, all these guys said it was really good, so you guys should probably feature it because it's, 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 it's gonna be a big track on Beatport. So I think we're kind of all saying the same thing. It's showing somehow by some means of data that this is gonna be a big seller and this is gonna be a good product on your shelves and it'll be popular because look at this indicator or look at that indicator, right? I mean, we're all kind of saying the same thing at the end of the day, yeah. Okay, uh, shifting gears a little bit, Jody. Um, so we've talked yes. about how does a label get the attention of consumers? Like, how do you get, how do you raise, you know, raise yourself above the clutter and, and the noise of, of uh, all these releases coming out in dance music? Let's take it a little bit further upstream, back towards the creator of the music. How does an artist get noticed with A and R of labels? So you're an artist, you finish a track in the studio. Now what? Now it's time to shop your track around to, to, to labels and get it signed, right? How do you get the attention of a and people that are getting hundreds of submissions every single day? Well, I think fundamentally, of course, from the ground, it, the music has to be good. It's just so simple. It has to be really, really good. Yeah, but, there's so mean, many, but there's so many great tracks, <laughs> you know as well as I do, yeah. that, that, never, that never even get listened to and that were excellent quality. So like, the, what? I, I think that's more of a technical thing where maybe they need to up their more entrepreneurial skills like connections, writing a good demo submission. But if the music's actually good, it will get listened to. Like, I mean, proper, proper good. Like from the mixing, from the production, everything, especially if it's more than one track. Like if it's one track, mm, people might pass on it. But if it's, you know, a good couple of tracks and it's done pretty well, it has a good sound, then I, the, the foundation's there. But Going, you know, past, moving away from the studio, I think good entrepreneurship skills, just being a good artist is like, it's not just about having the good songs, it's, it's the networking and, and how you present yourself to a label, even if it's a big label or, or a small label, just be professional. If you're gonna write a demo submission to a, a label, make sure your tracks are absolutely on point before you send them. Like, don't send them garbage. Because first impressions mean a lot, and um, if you make a good impression, it, I think it will stick. 
back to the music. It has to be good. And it, again, yeah, it's, it's the package. You got you to gotta present yourself well and you got to be professional. Make sure your social media is on point. You know, make sure how you present yourself is on point. And of course, the music has to be good. Yeah, but hang on. So what happens if I'm an artist, I'm a sick artist in the studio, but I don't really have social skills and business etiquette and I don't know about social media and I'm not a great writer to write up the description. Is it fair that my track would, will never see light of day or never get A&R attention from a label. I mean, that's kind of bullshit because that you it, just lost, right? It is, but I think honestly in this day and age, you gotta, you gotta get those skills. Like, you, I don't know, like, I don't know what it's like in the majors, how much you guys, I'm sure you guys support your artists a lot, but you can't just be a good dude in the studio. You gotta have some sort of entrepreneurship skills to a degree, like, you gotta be well presented, you gotta understand what the game is like, or at least just research the basics and then you can learn it per perhaps later in the game. But uh, the foundation is the music, but after that, like, y you have to learn those skills. Unless, uh, that's exactly what's gonna happen. If you don't learn those entrepreneurship skills, if you can't network um, at your social events, if you can't get in contact with these guys or don't know how to, or maybe that's that Asian mentality, maybe you're shy or something, you gotta break through that. If not, it, the music's never gonna get heard if you if you don't have those. So, so then you have skills. So, so then you have to be uh, you have to be a musician, an artist, a social media expert, a marketer, a to PR a person. To a degree. So what is the what is the percentage? How how much artist are you and how much marketer are you today in 2017 to get noticed uh, making a dance music release in your eyes? That's a good question. In, in terms of percentage, I'm not too sure. I think the majors might be able to answer that question, but it, it, there's definitely, I feel there's definitely more of a role outside of just the creation. Like you definitely have to have that some sort of character. It doesn't even have to be called business minded, but you have to have some sort of entrepreneurship skills to, uh, to, to, make, that, to make that first move. Um, I, I would say that, you know, the, the team needs to have that at the end of the day. I'm not sure the artist himself or herself will need to have all that skill, but if you don't have all that skill, at least know that you don't have it and find the right people who has it to team up, like, like the, the major labels or... But what if you don't have a team? You're an individual artist, you don't have a budget, you can't pay salaries. What do you do? I would suggest everyone to put your music out for free and get your first small group of following. Okay. That's, that's always the first step to do it now, to hold back your music and think that you, know, you can sell it for money later on is, is like decades old thinking. You, you can't think like that anymore. Get your own following, whether you use SoundCloud or YouTube, depends on what genre of music you do. Are you putting yourself forward or are you just putting your music forward? That, that doesn't really matter, but you need to find the right social media, the right platform to put your things out to reach to the people you want, want it to reach. Entrepreneurship skills. That's what I'm saying. Like, don't, I, I, I don't want to say the word treat, but treat yourself like a professional, like, like an athlete is going to train for an Olympics. Like, if you're an artist, don't just sit in the studio and just make tracks. Like, there's stuff that outside of the studio that you have lots to do. You got to have your social media game on point. You got to have your networking skills on point. You need to be able to come up to us at a random event and not be shy. Stuff like that. You have to make these connections. Like, it's a networking thing as well, as much as it's an entrepreneurship skill. I think that's something that a lot of people don't talk about. I deal with a lot of, um, you know, uh, small, small um, labels or, or a lot of emerging artists just coming out, just producing tracks, and it's, it's very, um, they're still in their infant stage where they're like, oh my God, I'm making my track, I hope it's really good. I, I, sit on the track for a bit, like sit, and work on your music first before you start approaching labels and work on your social media. There's so much to be done before you start approaching and start talking about licensing deals and et cetera, et cetera. I think there's, it's just not discussed enough in, in the music professional world. Everyone just thinks that, you know, all these music producers think that it's like, okay, I'm just gonna make one dope track and that's it. It's, it's really not. The reason why top artists are the way they are, it's not just because of their music and it's not just because of the support from their labels, it's because they work their asses off outside of the studio, I think. Do I have that correct? <laughs> well, so we have signed this 16 year old kid who was 14 actually when we, we signed him. He had no socials, he had no like, like limited social skills as well. Um, he's not an entrepreneur, 
uh, but he got the balls to step up to us and sh showed us his music. And what I'm trying to say is it's, it's, it's quite difficult to break into, like, like get in touch with a label, but you have to have some balls to like attend um, panels like this or like uh, ADE or whatever, but make sure to try to make a connection instead of waiting for you to get found, I guess. Is he, is he learning the social skills as well now, after you signed him? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, it's really difficult at that age to, sure. because you're, you want to make music, you want to be on stage. Sure. You, you're not thinking about uh, entrepreneurship. Yeah. There's, but but there's, no, there's no one size fits all, I think. It's like no, the, I think sure. the bottom line is like what you don't have yourself. If you, if you make great music and you, you, you can't do it, the rest, get someone to do it with you or right. for you, find a partner. Um, then, yeah, you don't just sit there and wait for us to sort of coincidentally hear of you or find you that that's, that's yeah, I wouldn't do that, make you unhappy. Okay. Uh, guys, uh, switching a little bit, um, let me pose you a scenario and then we'll go down the line and see what, what each of your perspectives are. We talk about localization and uh, 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 lifting local talent and, and giving people a chance and uh, uh, developing some of these markets we talk about in Asia Pacific or elsewhere. Let's imagine everybody on this stage is in a position of power because they can select who is going to be the next artist, who's going to be published and marketed, where money is going to go, um, who the next stars are going to be. These are people that sign artists, right? So I'm curious, in that seat, uh, let's imagine, um, and, and we'll start on the far side with you, Tan, and go down the line. Let's imagine you have two artists that have submitted equally good music to your label, new artists. And one is from your home country that I see on the board behind us here and where you live, and one is not. So local versus foreign. Do you sign the local artist? Do you sign the foreign artist? Or do you flip a coin? I, it depends on the foreign artist, if the, uh, the foreign artist is singing in a language that my company is, is in, is, is actually capable of operating in. If the artist is in a different language, or I mean, if it's EDM, then it's a different thing. The you know, language doesn't matter as much. But uh, I'm always paying attention to what my company's capability is. It needs to fit my my audience that that I'm catering to. In in this case, my my company is based in Hong Kong, um, operating to to bring music to all the Chinese community worldwide, worldwide, but the Chinese community because they're listening to Chinese music, right? Whether it's Mandarin or Cantonese. So I will always pick the artist that uh, is in that language or is appealing to the Chinese audience, yeah. But, but let's, but I guess maybe let me make it even more broad. Everything is equal. All things being equal. They're equal products. They suit the market, their language. The decision is between supporting local, supporting foreign, or you don't care. You flip I, I would give, Give uh, Ryan a call and tell him, you know, there's a great guy that, that, that you know, does, uh, does I don't know, uh, if he's Australian, does Australian dance music and stuff, he, he could probably work with him. I wouldn't say that he doesn't deserve an album, but my company is not the right company because I'm at the end providing service to, to the artist and then to the audience, right? So I need to know my own limit. Fair enough. Ryan? Uh, thanks for the call. Um, <laughs> so I think, look, I'm, I'm an Australian living in Asia at the moment um, with the purpose, you know, we're being aggressive in the market in finding developing acts and um, the focus at the moment is to find local talent and, you know, break that out and go global. So it depends to, the, to each situation, you know, for us, uh, that's one of my directors at the moment, so, and focus, so it would for sure be, you know, find a regional talent that we can break out on an international level, you know, and I think of all things given, and because dance music can cross so many borders, then that's so achievable. And that's not to say that we won't break international artists in here as well. Like, you know, Chainsmokers went, you know, platinum in three days in, on QQ Music, you know, so we and Alan Walker, 1.4 billion streams on Fader, like it's one stream for every person in China, it's ridiculous, but it's, you know, depending what your actual uh, directive at the time is, you know, what you're looking to do at that moment, because there is always so much music coming everywhere, but to answer that question, it's, yeah, a local artist to break out, that would be my go. Jody? 
I'm not, I'm not sure how to answer this question because I'm not a label myself, but I'm just going to pretend. Um, yeah, good point. It, it really depends on the strategy, on the deliverables. Um, what, what am I trying to achieve here? Um, yeah, it really depends. I, 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 would, I would probably lean more for the international artist just because, I guess, sonically, perhaps it's my, more my bread and butter. But uh, yeah, it really depends on the deliverables. Um, I, I can't say because I'm not an official label. We're a music platform, so yeah. Okay, Nabi, Japanese artist, foreign artist, or you don't care? Yes, um, I think uh, no, we don't want to release uh, um, uh, direct through that um, international labels. And um, back in the days, and uh, it works. Uh, however, now these days, it uh, should be uh, localized. So. Um, um, yeah, Japanese act collaborate with uh, yeah um, international uh, DJ producers and even on uh, the big or uh, small and uh, doesn't care and so um, uh, should be collaborate um, with uh, uh, for our market and then uh, um, yeah local uh, people DJ and local celebrity or. Yeah, that kind of people helps for the uh, track. So um, um, we need the contents, we need a track and a good song. However, um, I don't think, I don't believe and um, it doesn't work, um, it works and like an international hit and directly to the Japan and Asian market. And so on. we are totally different now. So. On, you guys know about this uh, issue, so um, then we um, make a, a good strategy and a good plans to release before that um, um, make a deal with some somebody. So um, yeah, we carefully. However, we have to be a speed up. Uh, so um, yeah, I th I think. Uh, yeah, it works. However, we make a special contents for Japan and Asian market. Okay, George, I would say both. <laughs> not an option. <laughs> well, I, I don't see why that's not an option. Well, in this scenario, it's the three choices. <laughs> I still would say both. You're gonna flip, I mean, flip you, a coin. You can market it totally different, right? Yeah. If it's, if the music is good, if the talent is there, well, why don't you sign them both? Okay. Nothing. I mean. I'd never make a difference between foreign or inter I mean, I, that, that's not, I mean, particularly also because in dance, I don't think it matters where you come from. And, 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 uh, and I think sort of gradually and, and every year it becomes more, it's a global business. There is no, I, to me, there is no such thing as a local dance artist. It doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, George, let me ask you, um, what is the profile of a marketable artist in the dance and music world? What, what, what does that artist uh, look and feel like? What are the characteristics of a highly marketable artist in 2017? I, I actually don't look at that way. Um, I mean, good music, of course, but are there any other, what are some other factors, if any? No, I don't think that's really important, to be honest. It's, it's music over numbers as well, because nowadays a lot of labels look at social profiles and reach and stuff like that. It's, I, I agree it's music over numbers, but it's like it, I do look into, you know, you, you want to work with people that want it really badly. You know, it's like if, if, if you come into a situation where I think or where I want it more than the artist, then we're wrong. It's like sort of I have to, they have to be driven to a degree of like almost craziness. They have to be, I mean, hard working, whether For that's sure, in the yeah. studio. It's like, I don't really want to work with, with, with people where I have to be the driving force. They need to want it. They need to have I a totally team that agree. wants it. Yeah. And that is for me, not I mean, the music first, and then that's the next thing I would look at. Hun like, hunger yeah, then yeah. Is, is a factor. Yeah. Tan, what, what, what would you say is a, uh, attributes of a marketable artist? The, the social media skill for, for me, because I'm, I'm in the pop scene. Uh, this, if they, they're really friendly, like, like they know how to navigate all their social media, is a huge help this stage. You know, a selfie sp speaks way more than, than you know, a perfectly filmed video this stage. You know, a, a good, funny 
tweet or good funny post and and that could only really come from the artists themselves sometimes you know you can have a group of young people in the background to help help them bring it out all the time but the the one that always gets the most like and view is the authentic post that the artists really post themselves and and that is is as as uh, rare as as a talented musician to be honest I think it's a good point. I think this all authenticity and realness. I mean, you see this not just in dance, but like if you look at at uh, people like uh, Ed Sheeran or Adele, well, it's like that's what people look for. You know? It's like and and the way the social media is sort of uh, is everywhere. It's like you can't fake that anymore. I think and that, that and that sort of filters through into dance music as well. You are either real, you want it, you want to do what you do, and and there is no. There's no window dressing anymore, I think. So, or t at least it doesn't work. It needs to be real. Okay. And uh, Ryan, question for, uh, for you on the Sony side. Um, you know, obviously, I think Sony at this point is making inroads into, into the Asia Pacific market more and more uh, in the dance music side. Um, what, are, what are two or three things that you think about when you think about attacking Asia Pacific's dance music market and, 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 and penetrating it as much as possible and uh, you know, making as much of an imprint as possible in China specifically? I mean, you've been here for a few months already. Like, what are, what are your observations? Yeah, I think um, you've got to come with respect to the market, that it is a completely different market. I think we all know that it comes with its own challenges from you know, social WeChats to Weibo's to um, you know, your streaming platforms. It's, it's a different playing field. It's understanding that. It's, um, Dance music is, as I said before, it's a, it's a very new scene. So it's you know it's spending time understanding it, you know, taking from those that are already involved in it. Don't come in thinking we're going to shape it or change it. You know, it's 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 read from the people that are already in there on the ground making it. Um, but yeah, totally, it's um, not not without its challenges, limitations. You know, from uh, even on the live side with uh, understanding the government restrictions, etc. That come in that you know play to festivals and uh, live shows. Um, so yeah, respect is probably the main thing I'd say. Come in, respect, understand, uh, and, and know what you're having to deal with because it, it is a different world, and every market's different. As you said, yeah, Japan's completely different as well. Uh, but if you talk about China, that it, yeah, that'd be my main points. Any additional notes there, Bard, on attacking the Chinese market from a major perspective? I think you have to have you have to be there. So it's like as what I said in 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 the keynote as well. It's like those ten com ten offices in 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 ten territories in in Asia and the and the regional team. That's where it needs to. That's where it's, that's where the work happens. You know, it's like sort of. Uh, Sorry, but I've got to say, we do have a regional office in Hong Kong as well. So, uh, you, know, well, <laughs> you said you only major with a regional office. That must be very, We I have thought, been there for a while. It must be very recent. Then. No, no, it's been there for a while. <laughs> Guys, uh, we're we're out of time, but uh, this has been a great panel. Uh, phenomenal insight from from some real uh, leaders and, and loud voices in our industry. Uh, I'd like to thank you guys for joining us. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.